and there's a lot of people getting laid off right now. You want to know the best way to get a job right now? Pick up the phone and cold call the hiring managers and sales leaders at these companies and just show that you can do the job right there on the phone. That's what I would be doing if I was a college student right there. So I'm thinking about skills, practical business skills. How do I accumulate these? Be bold. Don't submit an application for an internship and get thrown into a pile of 500. Pick up the, the phone or go visit their office. Go do something like that that actually gives you the hands on experience to see if you like it, because that's what I did. I wanted to be a forensic scientist. And you know what I did? I sat in a police station. I'm like, oh, there's two forensic scientists in the entire state of Oregon. And you know what matter forensic scientist does? They don't even know what cases they're working on because they don't want them to have any bias. I was like, that's that's really boring, dude. Welcome to the show. Don't forget to share with your friends. We've got Jason Bay on the show today, co-founder of Outbound Squad, a company that trains other companies' salespeople. So he's tried a lot of things in his 20s. He settled into a great business. By the time he was in his 30s, he's going to talk about the process to starting a company and forcing himself to be resourceful at an early age, which paid off later. Welcome to the show and welcome to the Edge of Excellence. Jason Bay, down with COVID. Still making time to come on the show. Thank you for coming on the Edge of Excellence today. I feel like we're both on the injured reserve list today, dude. (laughs) Yeah, well, for me, it's every five years. Every five years, I got something that goes down. Something's broken. Something's getting chopped on. This time, I get both. But I'm going to be waving my arms around, acting crazy to spite all my broken bones, and then I'll have to go get surgery. But let's not talk about that. Let's dive in the way we always dive in. Jay Bay, what is your definition of excellence? Yeah, for me, I what I think about is mastery and the pursuit of mastery. So when I think of excellence, I think of it as a pursuit. It's not something that is really an end destination, but it's something that you're always striving for. Like the the thing that comes to mind is that, have you seen that Netflix documentary? Uh, wow, it's about the sushi dude. What's it called? Jira Dreams of Sushi or whatever. Have you seen that? No, but I like sushi. Oh, I think you'd really like it. We got, I still remember that time that we got sushi that one time. I was like, that's still the best sushi I've had. But the documentary is about this sushi spot in Japan. It's known as one of the best places in the world to get sushi. I mean, people literally spend two, three years just perfecting how to make rice. Oh, I have seen it. Oh, it's so good. And when I think of excellence, I think of people that are really masters of their craft. And there's this sort of intangible thing that a Michael Jordan or a Tiger Woods or, you know, uh, any kind of professional athlete Uh, any kind of performer, any kind of thing like that, where there's this certain intangible thing where like, oh, that's that's world class, what they're doing right there. And this is someone that dedicates their life to getting better at this thing. That's what excellence means to me. Well, that that's a perfect introduction to our show, because we're going to have a discussion today of finding mastery. Jay Bay's been in marketing. He's been in sales. He's been in uh, outsourced, we'll call it outsourced sales and marketing, moved into training other people's teams. It's what he's doing now. He's dangling on the edge of excellence. His business is growing, and he spent a few years figuring out what to do for a living. So it's a perfect show today. Thanks for coming on. We're going to go way back, though, to Brookings, Oregon. Just real quick in high school, did you have your shit together? Did you know what you were supposed to be doing, or were you off puffing uh, um, whippets? and uh, uh, taking dab hits and uh, not really paying attention to the long-term life. Yeah. I don't even know if dabs were a thing at that time, but I was super straight arrow. So I definitely had my shit together. Um, I was valedictorian, 4.0 student, perfect grades. Um, You know, first team, all league at a small (laughs) high school for basketball, that kind of thing. The thing that was very different about me in high school was the... Household that I grew up in, my dad is an ex-Marine and uh, my mom is an immigrant. Uh, She moved from Hong Kong. And uh, so like it was very structured. The thought of, oh, running a business or getting into sales or doing something that's sort of outside of the box of going and getting a four year degree and finding a good job with a good salary. That was not something that was ever talked about, nor did I see any examples of that. So to me, it was like there were a lot of incentives to follow the rules. So that's exactly what I did. I got good grades. I never, I literally never went to a party ever. 
didn't drink any alcohol, didn't smoke any weed, <laughs> didn't do any of that kind of stuff. And honestly, looking back, I wish I would have lived a little bit more, but that was high school. And I was also super shy. It was very, very introverted. So huh. yeah, that was yeah. Yep. Isn't that funny. <laughs> so yeah. more power to your parents, right? Um, and I heard this line yesterday. If you're listening, pay attention to this. If you screw it up in your 20s, you're done for life. If you go on a deep end with alcohol, if you go on a deep end with uh, um, drugs, if you go on a deep end with whatever you can go on a deep end with, you're done. The beginning of your life is where you need to take care of everything. If that happens in your 50s, you develop a drug problem, an alcohol problem. Okay. You're not done for life. You can readjust. But in the beginning, you're fighting so hard to get ahead. So more power to the Marine and the immigrant from Hong Kong for getting you to understand that I better buckle my shit down and get together. And not everybody does that. If you're listening right now, and maybe your parents weren't so strict and maybe you didn't have that perfect focus, valedictorian, all league basketball that J-Bay did. But remember what I just said. If you blow it in your 20s, you're never going to catch up. And if you have some problems later, you're already so far ahead, you can have those issues. And I just talked to a guy yesterday about that. We were talking about you know, some things I'm not going to mention on the air. But it's just amazing if you think about that. So you're getting ahead as a valedictorian, playing basketball, being strict, missing some of the parties. Then you go off to college, and are you on that same path, or did you start rebelling? I never – I've been my rebellion – is starting a business and getting into entre entrepreneurship is what I felt like was rebelling against my parents. So in college, Oregon so, State, you were, you were getting good grades. You're uh... no, I didn't. Okay. I so as a the I went through an identity crisis as a freshman in college. So I went to Southern Oregon University, and what I didn't have anymore was I thought that I wanted to play college basketball. So I spent that my entire high school like I was. Like a typical day in high school was getting up at 4 30 in the morning, getting to the gym by five, working out for two hours, going to school, getting all my homework done, then spending four hours after that in the gym. That was what I did on a daily basis. When I didn't have that anymore, I decided at some point before my freshman year of college that I just didn't want to play basketball. I didn't really have a purpose for anything. I didn't have something that I was sinking a lot of time in that I felt like was good for my future. And that's honestly why College Works was such a big. Oh my God, I was just thinking, God, I will feel so good about myself if he tells me that College Works held him find a purpose. So you got, you got lost a little bit, which happens. I mean, yeah. it happens to a lot of athletes. You're the star yeah. high school athlete, and then you realize, oh, I'm never going to be pro. Maybe I need to find a different identity. Or me, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. It was my whole identity, and I realized I'm not detail oriented. Or Maybe you're really good at science, but you're not good at math. And you realize, oh, I got to change my medical plan. So this happens to a lot of people. And you stumbled across College Works. If you're listening right now, he's going to tell the story. Switch it back to 1.5 speed because both of us talk a lot. But uh, I want to hear, um, and you can talk about the College Works thing, but think of people that can't find College Works that live in a different state. What was the, what was the searching yeah. process that got you to find this new opportunity? I feel so good well, right now. I can't even feel my broken <laughs> scapula or spatula or whatever it's called. Shoulder blade. Broken uh, shoulder blade. Yeah. So uh, it really happened by accident. Barry Parker, you know, he's one of my best friends now. He came into a classroom and talked about it. And honestly, the only reason I signed up is because there was, oh, make $10,000 in a summer. And what I did the summer prior to that was stack wood on a cart at, a, at my dad's mill for 60 hours a week. And that sucked. I had mm -hmm. no social life. It was manual labor, which I think is good for people to do in their life, uh, some type of job or food service. But I was like, this sucks, dude. I don't ever want to do this again. And being around all the miserable people was just, oh, it was awful. So that was, it was just money, honestly. And when I started doing it, I didn't even know that I would be running a business necessarily. It's kind of hard to describe. I was so excited because it was something where there was a selection process where I was going to have to I was going to have to do something that wasn't just showing up to a job and clocking in and clocking out. And I think that 
like if I'm thinking about other people listening to this that maybe don't have an opportunity like that, like the stuff that I would be thinking about is how can you as early as possible in your career start to test parts of what you would be doing? So I'll give you an example. If you want to work on Wall Street and be a broker, stockbroker or whatever, go get an internship at one of those places. Go like one of the things that we encourage sales reps to do that we work with. So we help uh, sales reps selling business to business and software. And there's a lot of people getting laid off right now. You want to know the best way to get a job right now? Pick up the phone and cold call the hiring managers and sales leaders at these companies and just show that you can do the job right there on the phone. That's what I would be doing if I was a college student right there. So I'm thinking about skills, practical business skills. How do I accumulate these? Be bold. Don't submit an application for an internship and get thrown into a pile of 500. Pick up the, the phone or go visit their office. Go do something like that that actually gives you the hands on experience to see if you like it. Because that's what I did. I wanted to be a forensic scientist. And you know what I did? I sat in a police station. I'm like, oh, there's two forensic scientists in the entire state of Oregon. And you know what matter forensic scientist does? They don't even know what cases they're working on because they don't want them to have any bias. I was like, that's that's really boring, dude. This is not, this is not like CSI. Yeah, 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 you found out. So you're sitting in this class, you're stacking wood. And was it cut wood or was it like rough cut wood? Oh, so I was working in a place called LVL. It was these like really precisely cut, like picture like door jams, okay, uh, okay. door jams make, and things like that. I just like wanted that. to make yeah. sure those beautiful hands of yours weren't getting cut up on uh, bark or anything like that. <laughs> so you're sitting there and you don't like it. You don't like the mundane. You don't like the the people that you're spending time with on the job site. You are the sum of your five closest friends. You don't like working for just money. And Barry Parker comes in and says, hey, I've got this great opportunity. So you've got to be on the lookout for opportunities. you got to be aware of what you don't like and what you think you might like. And and Barry Parker came in with an opportunity to run a business, which you kind of didn't even know what that meant. Um, And it's all about the soft skills. I mean, there's so many people that want to be stockbrokers, so many people that want to be engineers, doctors, lawyers. They come in to to that business to develop the communication skills, work ethic, management skills, operation skills. So all of a sudden you're in this uh, soft skill business, which ended up being the business you went into later. Um, And so you're in class uh, and Barry comes in and you decide, I'm going to try this crazy college works thing. And that was kind of the shifting from your your shyness, kind of lost, didn't know what your focus was because you just dropped out of basketball and you just jumped into this new business world. Yeah. So the very first thing I did when I went through the hiring process with Barry and Dan and whoever else I had to interview with is this is just to let people know sort of how I think and operate. I went and bought a house painting for dummies book because okay. I didn't know anything about house painting. Yeah, yeah. And no one, no one does. Bought... You're the only one that ever did that. <laughs> yeah. And then I went and bought a sales book. And at that time, you had to go into a Barnes and Noble or a Borders. And it was Little Red Book of Selling by Jeffrey Gittimer. Um, So I just educated myself on what is the sales thing? And that got me into personal development and all of this other kind of stuff. And basically, I'm just chomping at the bit. I get hired in November and I'm chomping at the bit to get started in February. I didn't know that I'd be going door to door or I didn't really think about it. It probably got talked about, right? Oh, (laughs) we talk about it. We talk about it a bunch of times. But I, I mean, I tell you, and it's like the first weekend. Oh, my God. If you get your ass kicked and I got zero leads the first week and I did it. Oh, no. Everyone on the planet should go door to door for a weekend yeah. and then for a few hours a week because it tests how motivated you are, especially if you get yep. zero leads. I heard I heard a meeting the other day where some uh, someone was really bummed out that they had to do it for a whole weekend. And and the district manager's like, dude, you want to get leads right away. That's the way to do it. All your Facebook next door, the other forms of advertising. It takes a while. So you're out there knocking on doors. You, you ignored that part. You didn't hear Barry talking about that when he talked. By the way, yeah. shout out to Barry Parker. Love that guy. How many yeah. kids does Barry Parker have now? Great dude. He's got two. Two kids. Yep. All right. Two dogs, two kids. Um, so that was a really big pivotal moment for me as well, career wise. So Barry and I go out the first we, we we did like a test session during the week before the weekend. So he we, comes do that, to we do that across the board now. OK, so we go out. And we go and meet, and this is a small town. Brookings is about five or 6,000 people. It's a small town. And I am horrified. I'm sitting in my car and I'm sweating and just waiting for him to come out. And I'm like, oh God, I'm going to go door to door. I've done like the selling the Christmas wreaths to raise money for the basketball team stuff. 
But this is like, you know, I got braces at this time, Matt. I'm a freaking kid. And yeah. I'm about to ask people, these adults, to give me three to seven thousand dollars to pay to paint their home. And what he showed me there, the big lesson was the worst case scenario is that someone's gonna say no to you. And most people, if you approach it and you're confident and you make eye contact and you put a big old smile on your face, most people are not rude to you. And all of the lessons I learned, in, and I crushed it the first week in by the way, I got like 128 leads. I got all my friends out and we just crushed it, man. <laughs> but those lessons that I learned in 2008 going door to door, it's the same stuff I teach reps now because the reps that I work with now are inside sales reps. They cold call. And I'm like, dude, okay, really? So the worst thing that can happen is someone hangs up the phone on you. Yeah. They're not cussing you out it in their drive. It feels so horrible though. It feels so horrible when someone uh -oh. says no. And you got to get over it. My dad said to me, yeah. they're not saying no to you. They're saying no to what you offer. And I'm like, that's so dumb. I can't. It doesn't feel like that. <laughs> so I, I offered to do this life planning workshop with the home genius people. And no one responded. One guy. And Jeff is just like completely amazed. I can't believe it. I sent him your resume. I sent him your bio. I'm like. Yeah, they weren't excited by it. Doesn't bother me. And then I thought to myself, they're not saying no to me. They're saying no to what I have to offer. And I went, oh, my yeah. God, I finally got it. It's been 30 something years. <laughs> so it took me th yeah. literally it was yesterday. I thought, that. oh, my God, it finally sunk in. Yeah. Who cares? The road to yeah. yes is paved with no's. But more importantly, you're, I will never forget. I busted my ass for nine hours a day, Saturday and Sunday, the first weekend, and nothing happened. And I still went out again. I'll never forget yeah. that. As long as I live, I was 20 years old. You'll never forget that you organized all these people and you were scared and you went out there and got 128 leads, which is going to be in the top one or two every single year. We've done that business for 30 years and yeah. you'll never forget that. And you'll never forget the word. And you're still using it in your in your uh, um, world today, reminding the people you work with, it ain't that bad to get some no's because the road to yes is paved with no's. So um, you go out there, you do the college works gig, and instantaneously that becomes your family. So you kind of moved from a basketball niche to a business niche. And I'm just thinking about you're valedictorian, you're all league basketball, you got this Marine family, um, you've got this definition brewing in your head of mastery and world class. And then all of a sudden you just stumble across this, this thing that you, you weren't even planning on doing. And, and your story is a story of figuring out what you want to do with your life. You didn't know in college, right? So did it start to sit in and you start to feel like I like this business thing or what was going on as you were this successful yeah. lead getter and then successful manager? So I became obsessed with sales. I love sales. So one of the things that like, I was the manager that I created my own custom version of everything. So initial that's, call scripts. That's a I waste created, of time. <laughs> I created my own version of an initial call script, right? I created my own version of an estimate outline, all this other kind of stuff. And it was basically the same kind of steps and principles, but in my own language. Oh, well, everybody yeah. does that. I thought you were like yeah. recreating forms and getting stuck oh, in no. your room on the computer, not getting oh, out no, there no. and doing what really matters, oh, no. not picking it, the right oh. priorities. You're just making oh. it your own. I like that. Yeah, I was just get, and I got after it, dude, as, as a manager. Um, so what really cemented for me what I wanted to do was the next year as a district manager. So what what I found out that was really tough and the connection here is that I knew because of the experience I had with basketball and my basketball coach, he was a life mentor for me in high school. I knew that I wanted to coach people. So I thought that I wanted to become a teacher and coach. That was one of the things that you I, know, I wanted to be a teacher too. Yeah. And then you find out how little money they make, which is a whole nother topic. Well, I am a teacher. Like, I just get paid more. <laughs> exactly. So I figured out, oh, I can teach people business. And you know what? The learning curve, Matt, for me as a district manager was rough. I... What still sticks out to me, there's lessons because I work with sales managers now as well. One of the lessons that sticks out to me is there. We you guys had this like ten commandments of being a DM. Do you still teach that? Eight, eight commandments. Yeah. Eight commandments. One of them was basically your biggest strengths will be your team's biggest weakness. So like knowing your blind spots kind of thing. I think was one of them or something like that. And all of the stuff that was very intuitive to me in sales, which sales is a process driven function. It's very process driven. If you're selling a $3,000 paint job or 
for for me, some of the reps I help sell million dollar deals to Fortune 500 companies, it's very process driven. You follow the process. That was a very intuitive thing to me because I'm a very process driven person. So yeah. you know what I never talked about was following the process yeah. and how important that was. <laughs> yeah. uh, rapport. There's so many people that they have to be taught how to build rapport and given frameworks and guidance and things like that. We talk about rivers and streams in college works, I remember. Yeah. That to me, I didn't need that training. I'm like, are you kidding? I just need to bullshit with this person for 15 or 20 minutes about stuff yeah. they care about. That's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really, really struggled. And once I got through that learning curve, the thing that really stuck with me is I love managing salespeople. I love doing the trainings too and the speaking and the presenting and all that kind of stuff. So in 2009, I was like, you know what my dream job would be is being a sales trainer. Okay, so I'm going to back really up awesome. a little bit because that's not yeah. one of the commandments. And oh, you're just doing me so well today. I love that. That was you and I talking many, many, many years ago. And maybe it was me up in front of a room talking about my experience as a, as a district manager where I made yeah. a lot of money. And I just thought everybody knew how to make money, make money. And the lesson was teach others your strengths. Because you're already going to uh, teach them your weaknesses. You're already going to do that because you're so scarred. It was so much pain for you. And in my case, I was a horrible boss and everybody quit on me and they left her in my barbecue. And, you know, I had customers that I just gave them everything. So, of course, I, I mean, oh, to a, to an extent that was ridiculous. So, of course, you train the, the pain points. You train where you're hurt. And if you're listening right now and you're in management, Think about this. You're probably really pushing the things that hurt you. And then I think human beings are so humble that we just naturally assume, most of them, naturally assume that everybody's as good as us on everything else. And so my yeah. lesson when Adam Robinson went out and spent thousands of dollars on equipment, like gold-plated shit, like, what are you doing? And didn't make any money um, was, oh my God, I forgot to teach that guy what I already knew, what I took for granted. So you go back in there and you're taking some of your, you're, you're this kind of shy kid coming from a small town in Oregon that's trying to reestablish his identity. And you're not the super confident person that you're probably not even yet, to that point yet. And so you're thinking everybody's going to do what I do well. And you train just the things you did bad and they're not good at what you're good at. And you learn that lesson. Same, same. I learned it my first year DMing changed my life. Yeah. So you learned it. Your, and even though I talked to you about it, you still had to learn it yourself. Um, you yeah. learned it that first year DMing. And later on, you've decided that, okay, wait a second. I'm very, very good at training what I'm good at, training what I'm bad at, relating to people. And you go into the sales training business, which is such a cool um, story. And, and and just to give a little background to it, Jay Bay worked at College Works, which is one of the National Services Group company. Then you were hired to be the marketing director of National Services Group. And I, I re and my memory's foggy because various reasons. Uh, and I, I remember <laughs> you doing kind of a few things, um, but I know marketing was the main one, bringing in leads for various companies that we have. But then you you left us and you kind of had this four years of trying to figure yourself out before you went to Outbound Squad. By the way, if you want to get a hold of Jay Bay, OutboundSquad.com. The company's called Outbound Squad. You can hire them to train your salespeople. They're really good at it. Um, you can find them on LinkedIn. But what was happening in that four years before? This is really important. And, and my goddaughter's in this position right now. I think my son's going to be in this position right now. Mm -hmm. How do you know what you want to do for the rest of your life? You don't. You want to figure out something for a year, but you're going through this four year period of trial. No, I don't want that trial. No, I don't want that. Tell us about that period of your life. So I think there's a couple like macro things that I learned, and then I'll kind of zoom into that four year period. One is just to reiterate what you said about knowing what you want to do. I think that my generation and Gen Z and probably generations coming up, it's you're so exposed to information that you feel like you need to know what you're going to do because everything you see outside of you is that, oh, everyone seems to have this big purpose. And your 20s are not really about <laughs> like finding that thing necessarily. It's about doing the things. It's about trying a lot of stuff to see what you're good at and what you will like. I actually really like Mark Cuban's quote around, you know, don't follow your passion, follow your efforts. So what do you spend a lot of time on? Where are you spending a lot of your time? So where I 
So when I left CollegeWorks initially as a marketing director, this is in 2013, I left to start my own house painting business. And I did that for about six months. And we closed, I think, 350, 400 in revenue just in the springtime. And I did all of the sales. And biggest mistake I made was going into business with a business partner who didn't have the level of experience that I did and did not contribute to the business in the level that I did. And I'm 50-50 partners with this person. I, I just, it got to a point where I just couldn't stand working with him, Matt. So I left. Do we want to talk about his name? Oh, no, we'll skip that. <laughs> I'll share it with you after. Um, <laughs> so when that happened, I reached back out to Spencer and I was like, hey, like, I want some more hours because I was still cons doing consulting hours with you guys. And I was like, hey, I want some more hours. I want to get more involved again. And that went well for a little uh, a period of time. And And what happened was. I got really comfortable with that. I was making low six, uh, low 100K, 120K a year, that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, this is decent money. And I wasn't really pushing myself out of my comfort zone. And and honestly, dude, I was really scared to try something else because I didn't, I didn't know if I could do it. My mindset at that time was I only have industry experience in one thing. Yeah, but you're young. You don't have a lot of debt. You don't have oh, a lot I of did commitment. Have debt, actually. I did have debt. So another stupid thing I did when I was in California is I racked up $25,000 of credit card debt twice and paid it off twice. <laughs> so I was a okay. freaking idiot, dude. Yeah, well, you sound um, like my wife. Uh -huh. But you're still, <laughs> you're still young and you, don't, and you have relatively yeah. low debt and you don't have yeah. kids that, you, you know, you're strapped down. So that was the time yeah. to try. And if you're listening right now, you know, that's the time to try. Later in life, yeah. you've got commitments, you've got family. It becomes harder and harder. Doesn't mean you don't do it, but you know, it's always scary. So you're sitting there, you got this good job. You're working with Spencer. I remember this now. Um, Spencer, you, you guys set up a business. And instead of working for us, you start billing us, but it ended up costing us more. I remember that. Uh, and you're, you're building this yep. kind of consulting business and you still don't even think you can build a consulting business, which is amazing. Yeah. Back to that humility, but you're in your 20s. 20s is about trying lots of stuff. Mark Cuban says, follow your efforts, not your passion. You're on this definition of excellence, searching for mastery, searching to be world class. It's staring you right in the face. You're already yeah. doing it. I forget how old you were. You were really young, like 22, right? 23? Yeah. Well, I'm almost 34 now. So this was 10 years ago, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So you're Nine, 24 years, years old. Yeah. You already have yeah. a consulting business staring you in yeah. the face. And so instead, you go off and try this paint. It was a paint business first or after? That was first. That was okay. So you did the painting business. You come back to the consulting business again. Yeah. You still don't think you can start a business. Carry on with your story. Yeah. So there were two really big pivotal things for me that happened that helped me get my ass into gear in this area. I think one of them was meeting my now wife Sarah. Uh, I think that one of the most underrated decisions that you make in your life is who you choose to spend your life with. And hey, what world do you live in? That's not an underrated decision. Everyone I don't knows think that, that that's a big decision. Yeah, but the divorce rate is so high. Oh, oh, oh. no, that's that's a lack of commitment to your commitment. Oh, yeah. by the way, if you're well, listening right now, uh, you will almost get a divorce. You will need to go to a therapist. You yeah. will have major problems. You don't find the perfect person to avoid life's problems with. You find a great person not the perfect, a great person to navigate life's issues with side by side, side by side. And this is the hardest part of being married. Whatever their faults are, you chose to love them and you got to love them with their faults. My wife, messiest person I've ever met in my life. I'm a neat freak. I have to not ever complain about that again because I know who she is. Doesn't really stay too organized sometimes. I have to never, ever, ever say anything about that because I've chosen to be married. And this is this is meditation. This is um, yeah. Eastern studies. This is Christianity. If you love someone, you love them as they are. But we all complain about it. And then we get all pissed off and then we get divorced. So um, it's not an underrated decision. It's an underfocused commitment. And you might be a little bit more mature. So you got Sarah. She's not a perfect person. But at this time of need, what did she do for you? Yeah. And when I say underrated decision, I think being very purposeful about how this person complements your 
Oh my God, JB. Uh, just right now, yeah. I've got like two or three people yeah. in my company that need to jump off the boat and get some rings like Corey and Jack. <laughs> and if they're listening to this right now, I'm, we're going to have some serious problems. Get off your ass. So sometimes you just got to make a decision. So don't try to talk people into yep. overthinking the marriage. My marriage was like watching a movie. And then about six months later, I realized I was in the movie. And yeah. my wedding was more of like a wedding for the family than it was for me. That's life. Been married for almost 25 and a half years. Never going to stop being married to my beautiful wife, Jill, who's not perfect and neither am I. But go, go on with your story of not talking Jack and Corey into not getting engaged. And you two are very fun to spend time with, too. Um, so what Sarah, because I was I had this I had to make this decision where, you know, college works was about 80 percent of my pay as a consultant. That, that was 80 percent of my revenue was coming from that. And I had to make this decision like I'm trading time for dollars when you do hourly billing. Yeah. And I had to make this decision. Do I want to build something bigger than this? Because right now it's not going to get any bigger in this way. And I was really scared to do that, man. I, I was very scared. I don't know if I would. How did you get over the fear? Because so someone listening right now is in the same yeah. boat. They're very scared. How did you get over it? Sarah said, I believe in you, man. Oh, you can do this. And that was enough for me because and this is what I mean about choosing your partner. It's it's uh. Like I respect her like as a person, like her opinion. Yeah. And I know that if she says I do something well or compliment, I know that that's not bullshit yeah. because she wouldn't do it otherwise. Yeah. She's not a fluffer <laughs> type, a fluffy type of person when it comes to that kind of stuff. Wow. And dude, that was all I needed to hear. I'm glad that like, our, okay. I'm glad our audience is of a younger generation. So they didn't catch up on that fluffer comment you just made, but keep going. <laughs> They don't know what that is. Keep going. <laughs> Look at I'm, glad, up. I'm uh, glad your wife's not a fluffer or never was a fluffer, uh, but she, she hits you straight up. She's honest with you. And I just want to, I mean, yeah. these shows go wherever they're going to go. So this one's going to go into this marriage thing. Um, yeah. You know, you never know for sure, but you're thinking about, hey, what are our values? Do they align? Do I respect yeah. this person's opinion? Can I work to continue even if shit goes down? So you just have this moment. And, and were you already married? Yes. Okay. So you have this moment of reaffirming your decision. You didn't know it but when you got married where she says, I believe in you. And it was just enough. You kind of believed in yourself, but you needed that backup of this person you love and your person you respect. And you decided to go into the business and keep going. Oh shit. This is actually, this is before, right before we got married, actually. This is right before. Oh, so we were, see, there we you go. Looking. It was one of the yeah. affirmational things that made you feel okay about getting married. And by the way, again, yeah. You're not certain until like, I thought my wife's going to divorce me till like 10 years into marriage because I was 26 and she was 22 when we got married. I'm like, how do you make a decision oh, wow. at 22? You just never know. But sure, you're getting yeah. this more affirmation, more affirmation. Keep going. So, yeah, this was. And then when she said that we were living together at the time and I was like, which yeah. the show does not endorse. Yeah, we do not endorse premarital cohabitation, but keep going. Oh, God, this is an old fashioned so show. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up, um, dude. My shoulder is hurting so bad. All I want to do is pop another one of those codeines. I've been waving my <laughs> arms around. I got a broken rib and a broken yeah. spatula. Yeah. So she said that and I was like, okay, cool. Let's go. So I started thinking about and really getting resourceful about things that I could do. And I went down a lot of different avenues of, okay, I have this expertise in construction. What if I start like really doing cold outreach and it's cold emailing, cold calling other construction companies and seeing how I can help them with their marketing and sales. And then through doing that process, they said, hey, that was a really cool email that you sent me. Could you help my sales team do stuff like that? And I and hear the this first... all the time, the serendipitous win. So you're, yeah. you're in this, what do I do? And you're cold outreaching. You're not thinking you're going to teach people how to generate leads and teach people how to set appointments. You're looking for a partnership or something like that. And this yep. out of left field opportunity comes. That's how it works. You got to have that open mind. So yep. you're brainstorming first, you have an open mind second, then what happens? And then I get this client that they're, they're basically like, Hey, this is really cool like help us create some copy for some cold emails that we can send and help us get some appointments. So I end up doing that and it works out really, really well. And this is around, it's like early part of 2017. I was like, Oh, I have something here that's repeatable. 
like I have something here. And Matt, I didn't even know what the business model should be or even how much I should charge for it or even how to find out how much I should charge for it. <laughs> I just yeah. did what sounded good. So I did it. We got some really good outcomes. And then I started getting other clients and I had, this is another important lesson, I think, before starting a business, at least a service-based business, if you're trying to bootstrap it like I did, is get some clients as a freelancer or a consultant first and then build a business out of that. I think people build, they start a business, quote unquote, they register the name and do all this other shit. And then they don't even have clients yet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not a business if you don't have well, clients. And that's a college first. works thing. It, it, the first thing you do, you've been trained for two days. You're out there getting leads. You yep, don't even you've never even touched a paintbrush. You don't even know what that is. You've never hired a person. You've never even yep. looked at a P&L statement. Three months from now, you're going to have a P&L statement. Get the damn clients. Quit designing logos. Quit making forms. Quit worrying about the paperwork. So you so you get clients, you're doing freelance, which dials in what your service is, maybe even dials in what your name is and what your business is going to be. Exactly. So then Sarah and I, we actually start this business together. That's what we decided to do. Yeah. So we start this business together in 2017 and then we roll in those first five clients. And then we basically have an agency where we do done for you appointment setting. And uh, it went really well. Uh, this first, like the, our first year in business, we made like $300,000 almost in profit, you know? So I'm like, oh, this is great. And so more than doubling your money, you walked away from a pretty steady income. It was very scary, but in your first year, yep. you more than doubled your money. Yep. And then there's a whole personal finance lesson that, you know, we looked at the end of the next year and we're like, wow, we, we, where'd all this money go? We're living, but this is when we moved to Austin, Texas, right around the time we met up with you and Jill on our way to Austin. And, uh, that's a whole, we can dig into that if you want. But that was the biggest lesson I learned from that experience is, hey, I have the, a pretty good knack for making money, but I don't know what to do with it oh, afterwards. That's, that's my problem. <laughs> Buy Ferraris, dude. That's what I did. Get yeah. Three Ferraris, put them in the front yeah. yard, do donuts all the yeah. time, and then lose yeah. all your money and sell all your Ferraris. It's a perfect idea. Yeah. <laughs> so we end up doing that for a couple of years. It goes well. And what we realize is that, hey, this is a business that in order to scale like a marketing agency, you got to you got to have pretty fat headcount. You know, every certain amount of clients needs a certain amount of people. And I just didn't want to build a business like that. And I was doing a lot of thinking. So this was maybe three years ago, three or four years ago. And I was like, you know what? You know what I don't do right now that is really in my zone of genius? When I think about the things that I do that I am the best at, it's it's getting in front of a group of salespeople and like talking and speaking and training. This is what I did as a marketing director. You know, I did like 12 to 15 trainings a year, which was crazy, by the way, you know, traveling every weekend for, Oh yeah, no, no, I, I had you do them. So I didn't have to. Yeah. yeah, yeah I know. It, it, was, it was the best experience though, Matt, because I got so much repetition and I remember I learned so much. I got to do one with Spencer. Uh, I learned a lot from working with him. I went out and did one with Johnny one time and I, I, and I got to interact with a lot of these VPs and see how they speak. And I just learned a lot. I went through a learning curve there that when I got back into doing it now for what I'm doing, it just was second nature. So, yeah. so, and I just want to hit that you're brainstorming. What am I good at? You're keeping an open mind, weird, different doors open and you decide, wait a second, I'm going to dial it in with freelancing. You're reinventing and reinventing and reinventing the model. And then the sixth step, you stop and you go, wait a second, I like this term. What's my zone of genius? I call it unique ability. It's what you're really good at and you like doing. Maybe zone of genius is a little bit of a notch up from that. And you kind of remember back, where have I always really been crushing it? And it's in your case, um, in person or on Zoom, transferring of skills, whether it's to one-on-one yep. -on -one, five on one, 30 on one, you realize your zone of genius is in the communication of skills and the training of skills and getting the initial adoption of skills. And that's one of your zones of genius. And I'm assuming that you come up with a second zone of genius. You're great at following up on it and tweaking the implementation. So how did that change your business model? So what we started to do, the very first training gig that we got, I just started to talk to companies about it. And I put it on our website, <laughs> sales training, which we had never had that on the website before. And they had never had it, it in their business, I bet. Yeah. And they, it attracted a very, dude, there's so many learning curves because it attracted a very different kind of client. So I went from basically doing services for small businesses to now 
you know, a big client that I landed through Garrett Grashian, um, Zoom. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, because he had saw me putting out a lot of this content. And he's on a he's in a division of their at the time they had about 120 account executives. And um, I'm like, OK, like this is attracting a very different type of client with a very different type of sales cycle. So when I sell to small businesses with less than 10 people, I interact directly with the owner. When you sell to Zoom, you don't interact with you don't interact with the C-suite. You're probably not going to interact with a VP unless it's a really big deal size. And you're uh, it's it's very different. You know, that was like a. It was like a $50,000 project, yeah. you know? So I start to get more into that kind of line of work, which has got a whole bunch of different learning curves and different types of clients and all that kind of stuff that we can dig into if you'd like. But um, I was like, oh, I like this. This is pretty cool because the stuff that I'm doing is higher impact. I'm transferring skill, like you said, and I really like this. I'm getting to train and work in front of salespeople and do the thing that really energizes me. And so, the business so, prior so to that didn't energize me. So for the people listening right now, because this is interesting, um, you know, they, they don't know what they want to do. So they stop and they start brainstorming. They keep an open mind. What are they good at? What are, what, I mean, probably not zone of genius yet. We're, we're the edge of excellence. We're not mastery of excellence yet. Um, and they're checking things out. You try something, you know, you're pretty good at it. And then another door opens and you try that. And you're pretty good at it. So I think the system is. Try, measure, adjust, try, measure, adjust, try, measure, adjust. And you got to measure profitability if you're in business. You could be really good. You could get great ratings, but it doesn't make any money. You could make a great product and nobody buys it. Um, so yep. try, measure, adjust, try, measure, adjust. And so you start honing in. And when you're young, you can change, right? 51 years old, um, it's harder to you know go from B to business to consumer to business to business. It's hard to go from directly interacting with a certain group of people to directly interact with another. But when you're young, you can make these adjustments pretty quickly. And so you realize that you want to start dealing with bigger clients because it's more in your zone of genius, right? You're loving it more, which therefore makes it easier to get better at. Is that, is that what's happening? Uh, yeah, I've always been someone that can grind. So I, I can do stuff that doesn't energize me, but you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to be as good. The output's not going to be as good. So yeah, I'm, I'm starting to do stuff that really energizes me. And oh man, it's so funny. The stuff that I learned as a college works intern and as a district manager, it's the same stuff in B2B, man. It's it's the sales cycle and the process is different for B2B and what they're selling. But all of the soft skills are almost exactly the same. Instead of selling to a husband and wife or a we should probably not say husband and wife, a, 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 a couple, a married couple or whatever. A partnership. Um, a partnership, a homeowners. Now I'm selling to a buying community that might be 10 to 15 people at a large business. Yeah. It's really a lot of the same stuff, though. So, uh, yeah, I think the other you know, kind of big lesson there, like you said, is it's this agile approach. It's not getting discouraged. It's treating everything like an experiment is that you're supposed to find out like a great outcome from that experiment is finding out that you don't like it or that, that it doesn't work. Yeah, what that's not a, that's to a, do is as important as what to do. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I learned through that process. OK, so you're honing in, you're honing in. And this is where you land. You're in the you're in the business to consumer. I'm going to train your people how to sell. I'm going to train your people how to communicate with their customers and their potential customers. And now you and the reason why th th there's this niche is because the companies don't know how to do it and the companies don't do it. So they realize I need training and they hire out these specialized training services of which you are. And that's what you're doing today. Right. Correct. And now your business um, and how, how old is the business now? We started formally in 2017. So what, six years, I guess. Five, and then years. when did you, so 2017, and this is another great part of business. You don't start making money for a while. And sometimes you don't even hone in on what you're doing for a while. Um, you start doing one thing. And if you uh, measure, adjust, try, measure, adjust, try. You might be doing something slightly different. When did you, so 2017, you start, when did you fall into this model that you're in now? Probably first part of 2020. 
uh, right when COVID hits. Uh, so, so you have to adjust how you do it. And now you're on Zoom and yeah. now you can't go there. So 2020, you get your model. Now we're in 2023. So you've been doing it for three years and you're now at the point where the business is going from one level to the next level. And um, you're hiring more people. You're hiring people to duplicate yourself. Um, you're growing the business. And it's only been three years that you've had this model. There was four years of trial and error and finding yourself three years of dialing in your model. So we're looking yep. at a 10 year process from the day that you decided I'm going to start off in business myself. And now that you're pretty successful. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you say that because I don't really think about that oftentimes, but yeah, that's a, that's a decade, dude. And I think that. Which a decade is a long time when you're listening right now and you're 23 years old and you think you have to have it yeah. done by the time you're 30. There's numerous episodes that I've had about how success doesn't typically come by 30. You're not typically going to retire by 30. And even if you did have a gazillion dollars by 30, you're probably not going to want to retire because you like it and you have a passion for it and it feeds you, which is what's happening to you, right? Yeah, no, totally, dude. It's, uh, I think looking back, another thing that I was pretty intentional about in my 20s was taking risks. Yeah. It felt like a big risk for me to move down to California and be a marketing director. Yeah. And Spencer, the way he pitched it was like, we don't even, Spencer and Jay, Jay was really the big part of bringing me back. Oh, and nice. yeah, he was, it was his idea. Oh. So he's like, hey, Jay Bay's done all these creative marketing things for us and all this alternative marketing. Like, why don't we make him see if he wants to be marketing director? And uh, I remember Jay and Spencer were like, we've never had this position before. And we kind of have some projects that we want you to work on, but we don't really know what that's going to look like for you on a day to day basis. Are you down to do this? <laughs> And yeah. I'm like, yeah, dude, sign me up, you know, and the stuff that I had to learn, Matt, like we, it was stuff we would talk about. I had to learn about generating leads. I had to learn about call centers. I had to learn about the software. I had to learn how to hire a call center manager, what to expect of the agents. I had to learn how to do all of that stuff at like 21 years old, 22 years old, dude. Mm. And I think putting myself into positions where I'm going to have to be really resourceful do that as much as you can in your 20s. Do that as much as you can, because the skills I learned as a marketing director, again, I still use those today. A lot of the stuff I learned in call centers, it's the same principles I teach large inside sales teams that sell B2B. It's the same stuff. So put yourself in a position where it pushes you outside of your comfort zone and be like really comfortable with a lot of ambiguity. If you can put yourself in more situations like that, you're going to gain confidence from it and you're it's going to force you to learn a lot of skills. So take chances, do what you don't know how to do, force yourself to be resourceful. And I want to back up on one thing. None of it works if you can't do the grind. The most oh, important God, yeah. is work your ass off. In one yep. week, get two weeks of normal people's work done. The average American worker works 3.6 hours a day. The average what? person, <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, the average person on my show works 80 hours a week. I mean, oh, we wow. all worked 80 yeah. hours a week in our 20s, and we got like three decades done in one decade. Yeah. J-Bay got three decades done in that decade where he figured out his business. So it doesn't work if you're not working hard. It's the momentum. You know, how fast are you going to move that vehicle? You are the vehicle. Are you going 10 miles an hour, working 3.6 hours a day, or are you working 15 hours a day trying crazy shit figuring out what you don't know how to do, forcing yourself to be resourceful. And that's kind of the sacrifice. I always ask people, what's a sacrifice that you never regret? Moving down to California, taking this chance. That seems like a sacrifice that you made that you're probably never going to regret. Yeah, I am really big on Jeff Bezos talks about that a lot. Regret minimization. Hmm. So like think 10 years from now, what am I least likely to regret or most likely to regret? And look at your life right now and just ask yourself that. 10 years from now, what am I most likely to regret about my situation right now? Well, I know what I'm going to most likely regret. I'm going to most likely regret taking up extreme sports as my as my <laughs> athletic endeavors. And I'm going to most likely regret that all of my joints are now torn to shit and I need five <laughs> years of surgery. But I'm not supposed to talk about that. Keep going. Uh, I so need the stuff that I thought about, there was like a big moment for me when I was when I decided to leave college works full time, that was a hard decision for me, man. Like I like talking to Spencer about that was really hard. But what really inspired me at that time is my uh, I had an ex-girlfriend in, in high school. She like had dropped everything to pursue her dreams as like a country singer. 
and she like moved to Nashville and did all this stuff. I'm like, wow, she's taking a chance on herself to do that. I want to run a business. This is what I've always wanted to do. Like now is as good of time of any, you know? And I think about you're, you're totally right. You will not regret working your ass off in your twenties. You will not regret that. What you are going to regret is having to work 80 hours a week when you're forties, dude. Because yeah. that's going to fucking suck. That's going to yeah. really suck when you, and not by choice, because you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, yeah, I, t- I totally hear you. Regret minimization is something that me and Sarah, when we think about our relationship and where we're at, like, that's something that we talk about a lot. It's a really great exercise to do. Uh, and it's an exercise that you go through. All right. Well, yeah. I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, did you expect, and I already asked you about the sacrifices. I like to ask that, that question, but where you're at now, does that surprise you from that kid in high school crushing it in basketball, wanting to be a college basketball player? Yeah, I am surprised at where I'm at right now. I'm making more, quite a bit more money than I thought that I would make right now, which is, which is good. I'm not super coin operated, uh, but it's, it's nice. Um, I think that the other thing too, is I, I'm also Dude, I'm this is my dream job, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's certain stuff that I don't like about it. Of course. Yeah. Uh I just didn't I I didn't believe that that could be a reality. So, yeah, totally. Yeah, so one of my guests, Joe John Duran, talked about finding what your purpose for life. And I and I found my purpose for life. Um, but if you look at your your process here, brainstorm, keep open-minded, uh uh dial it in, reinvent, reinvent, try, measure, adjust, try, measure, adjust. That's the life plan with a lot of work and a lot of patience to find out why you're here on earth. And you found out why you're here on earth. You love it. I appreciate you sharing this whole system and this whole process with all those people in their 20s that are trying to figure out why they're here on earth. Thank you for making time while you have COVID. And thank you for coming on the Edge of Excellence today. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun.